Hello, everyone, and welcome to What's Wrong with the Podcast. Today, we have the great pleasure of speaking with Fatima Ori. Fatima is the Kelsey's Director of Field Building and Capacity. With a communications degree from Northwestern University and a public policy master's from UC Berkeley, managing meaningful nonprofit programming is her sweet spot. She leads the efforts to grow the field of leaders, advocates, and champions of disability forward housing solutions. She dreams of a day when affordable, accessible, and inclusive housing is a given for any new development. She is fueled by the Kelsey's commitment to a co led movement by people with and without disabilities. She uses a cane for balance and coordination. Born and raised in San Francisco, now an Oakland resident with her husband, Seth, and dog, Duke Ellington. When she's not working, she loves to travel, bake, and adhere to a strict skincare routine. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our podcast. Today, we have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Fatma Ori. She is the Director of Field Building and Capacity at the Kelsey. Hi, Fatma. How are you? It is very early here, but I'm happy to be here. We really appreciate for making the time of such an early and for those of you not who do not know her time, it's 7.15 at the moment, I believe, right? Like <laughs> early morning. Yes. I'm not a morning person, so I greatly appreciate your presence here. So thank you. And I hope you have a coffee, a cup of coffee next to you. <laughs> yeah. So please tell us more about you and your background. Sure. Um, I have been a part of the Kelsey team for about 18 months. And my specialty is really not people with disabilities. It's, it's more um, nonprofit program management. So um, I got my bachelor's degree from Northwestern in Chicago, and I got my master's in public policy from UC Berkeley. And ever since I graduated, it's just been a string of nonprofits. Um, and then I became disabled myself. I got diagnosed in 2014. So that kind of put a new lens on nonprofit program management. And so, like I said, I've been with the Kelsey 18 months and it's been fantastic. This is some of the most meaningful work that I've done in my career. Yes. And can you please tell us more about Kelsey so our audience also knows about the meaningful work? Sure. We are a nonprofit that pioneers um, unique housing solutions, not just for people with disabilities, but for everyone. So um, the Kelsey has this very cool dual mission where we build communities on the ground, but we also engage in advocacy and policy change work. So um, there are a lot of organizations that do one or the other, but the Kelsey is really um, committed to doing both at the same time. So we have two housing developments that are being built right now, one in San Jose, California, and the other in San Francisco, California. And we're running a pilot program at a place called Atlas that is in Oakland. So um, we're really looking, especially this year, to branch out to um, new geographies and new parts of the country. So stay tuned. Um, we are doing work in a number of different places that I think are fertile ground for us to end up doing developments. Um, so I'm I'm excited about the prospect of going beyond California. Uh, well, we met Kelsey um, last year, I guess. Yes, we're in January. So um, we got really excited as um, we do feel the discussions and work uh, in built environment around inclusion is quite lagging actually in the United States. And, um, you know, I think lagging maybe globally, but I feel like in US it's like further lagging given that, you know, 
since ADA, it has been like 30 plus years and we don't necessarily see much uh, innovation in the space. Um, so I would love to hear your thoughts on what you're observing in built environment and what is most problematic that we need to address. Well, I'll, I'll take those backwards. Um, the, the most glaring thing is just the fact that with the current housing stock that we have in the US, um, not even 10% of it is accessible. So I think that's the most glaring thing, just about accessibility and the fact that there aren't more options for people who have um, access needs around mobility, um, that they have very little to choose from when it comes to housing. What I will say about what I'm seeing is there is this very big focus on environmental sustainability, which is not a bad thing, but um, I think it's more important for our lived spaces to be accessible rather than to be sustainable. I'm sure you are familiar with LEED. Um, so I feel like that is kind of the soup du jour of everyone wanting to be LEED certified. But, um, and I, I just think that with the pattern of like you were referring to ADA, um, unfortunately people with disabilities often get put behind the eight ball. So, I feel like the moment that we're waiting for is kind of yet to happen. I certainly agree. And I think it's about time that we understand uh, what we really should mean by sustainability. Like for things to sustain, it needs to work both for the planet, but also the people, right? In the end, I think we're forgetting that we're building spaces for humans. And if it doesn't work for humans and longevity, that's not a sustainable building. If we're have to gonna demo it in like, you know, the next 10 years and build again, we're not being necessarily sustainable. And right. I think that we need to get to that uh, thinking. What it's it's cool to see what has happened in built environment inter or still happening because obviously there's so much work to do still in terms of sustainability, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago that was like a luxury statement, right? Like having a sustainable building, now it's like a must have. So in that sense, it's good, but we also need to um, uh, redefine what we mean by sustainability as uh, in the end, spaces are used by people and it's for people. So in that sense, I certainly agree with you. Um, how, what are, can you walk us through some of the things Kelsey is working on to also like address some specific issues, like maybe some case studies? Well, one of the programs that I run is called the Housing Design Standards for Accessibility and Inclusion. And this is basically a very robust set of over 300 elements that aim to equip architects, developers, and designers with a kind of blueprint of what inclusive accessible housing looks like. And this is something that we're shopping around to not only architects and developers, but um, public officials, um, disability advocacy organizations. Um, our point is just to have it reach far and wide that there is a blueprint for exactly what we're talking about in terms of accessibility and inclusion. And these design standards were first published in 2021, and we continue to try to push the ball forward um, when it comes to architecture, we have, um, we're really passionate about including people in your team 
that come to the table with lived experience. So um, our major partner, um, his name is Eric Mickleton, and he's actually an architect with um, two different disabilities. So, um, it, you know, it's not just a bunch of able-bodied people saying this is what accessible housing needs to look like. We really pride ourselves on bringing people to the table who actually look like our end user. Yes, and that kind of highlights the need of understanding co-design and co-creation with communities that we're serving, right? And uh, I want to highlight this because I think when we use, especially in the architectural domain, when we use the word like co-design, sometimes people get a bit defensive, you know, like, but, you know, like we're the architects, we're the designers. And I think it's really about like understanding um, the community and really synthesizing the information to see how that might reflect into the design. And I think that's, people need to understand that that's what we mean by co-design and it needs to be implemented in order to be able to deliver um, an authentic outcome really that serves uh, communities. But I also do want to highlight, and you mentioned a good point about like, for example, Eric having two different disabilities. Um, I think, you know, with like disability, especially in ADA, there's a lot of um, really baseline requirements, right? Like, oh, there's a wheelchair use, let's put a ramp or whatever, like very just like very prescriptive, um, very just like addressing baseline. But um, to exactly your point, people have varying combination of needs, right? There might be two disabilities, there might be a temporary disability and a disability. There may, might be a few temporary disabilities going on at the moment for an individual, right? So there's an outcome of the, uh, the intersectionality of all of these features that also spaces need to deliver. And um, we're still trying to push away from like just simply access, but like to inclusion, right? But then we also need to think about the intersectionalities of all these um, characteristics that we might have uh, that might have added requirements and needs. And, um, I think this exactly like we talked about co-creating and including people in the process like that is number one. Um, mm -hmm. Is there other like solutions or processes, um, frameworks that you think that it needs to be implemented for us to really be advancing the conversation from access to inclusion to really like authentic inclusion and equitable spaces? One thing that you said reminded me of another highlight from the design standards. So um, the design standards are cross disability, which basically means that instead of a diagnosis or symptoms, we choose to address the access needs that people might have. Um, so throwing away like diagnoses and making it medical, it's just about um, how people feel most comfortable in their housing. So um, like I said, they're cross disability, which I don't know if this is true in Turkey, but here in America, there is a lot of like, Life House for the Blind and this Autistic Society over here. And there's not a ton of things that are cross disability because people form these little cohorts designed around a specific disability like autism, Down syndrome, like um, bl blindness, deafness, um, and instead of all working together, we're in these little silos um, w surrounded by people that have our exact same disability. And one of the highlights of the design standards is that we really take an active step in 
trying to move away from that and have it more be like you have a, you identify as disabled and it doesn't matter as much what the doctors say you have, but we want to address your mobility, your cognitive access, your health and wellness in terms of um, making sure that all of your access needs are met in your housing. I love... Um the word uh, feeling like uh, comfortable that you said, yeah. because it's so important as, you know, like sometimes, and we see this in US and in Turkey too, like uh, there is an effort, for example, to make an entrance accessible and a ramp is in place. And then sometimes the ramp is even not accessible if you're like walking on it, it's too steep, right? Like I literally had this experience like two weeks ago in Istanbul where I was trying to like push a stroller it felt like it was uphill, like there, there was a ridiculous slope or like it's too narrow here or it's portable, you know, so you're waiting for something. And um, just because you're technically giving access also doesn't mean that you're really delivering on that, right? Like it, there's, um, if it's still feeling like a burden to the individual or you're also feeling excluded by having going through an experience, um, right. that is not necessarily creating access. Right. Or like forget inclusion, but it's not even really like we need to also like um, understand what access means should be like real access. And then we like build um, on top of that. And I love that, you know, um, you talk about like kind of the uh, outcome from like cross pollination of everything. And uh, because that example is so rare to your point, there is generally there's a lot of um, and this this happens already in like other countries too, but typically what we see also in a nonprofit space, there are many nonprofits working on almost similar causes, but in their like own effort and there's not much collaboration that we see. Um, yeah. And yet that collaboration is so, so crucial to push for the change that we also want to see. Um, yeah. And to your point, you know, um, nothing happens in silos really. Like, Dennis and I were just talking about like eczema, like even like for the eczema association, right? Like, why are we like talking more about like also mental health and stress relief and not just symptom treatment, right? So why don't we like do cross diverse collaboration on that too? And I think um, that example has to be set somehow uh, in so that it not only uh, expands into in, within US, but also sets an example in the world. Um, because we don't necessarily see that. And um, it, it's fascinating because we know uh, when we address things in silo, we're not necessarily solving for the problem. It's kind of like uh, taking something out of a real life context and studying it in the lab and saying like, this shit, this is how we could like solve for it. Whereas like you're never in that like contained, uh, isolated mm -hmm. environment, right? So um, in that sense, I think we have to really change the game and how we're also like approaching um, this problem. So we all, we make most like effective use of our time resources. Like it's actually good for like everybody. Um, yeah. So I love like Kelsey also really just like is building a community of members too in that sense. Uh, do you want to talk more on that? Like uh, how people can become partners of Kelsey? Um, what, well, one of the ways I created last year, and I'm very happy that Sour is a part of it. So we have um, something called Committed Firms, which are just basically entities that believe in the design standards and what we're trying to do around accessibility and inclusion. So there is joining on as a committed firm. And then um, we have this thing called the Inclusive Houser Network that is made up of over 16 organizations throughout um, the US. And they're all um, either in development or operational in terms of um, offering inclusive housing. and 
these organizations go from California all the way to DC. So um, becoming part of our inclusive housing network, um, the committed firms, and then, you know, I don't want to boast, but I feel like the Kelsey <laughs> had <do. laughs> the Kelsey has a fair number of fans, like people that are just excited about what we're doing and willing to help us kind of spread the word. And that is definitely a, a less formal network, but still um, important to have people out there who understand what we're trying to do and why it's so important. Yes, and we're proud fans ourselves as well. And I'm sure it's only, you know, going to grow into a very, very large community of fans. Um, so I would love to kind of like get your thoughts on what would be the vision, right? Like what is it, where do you see like if Kelsey really like succeeded in everything that it aimed for, what would we want to see in United States and hopefully uh, there, globally thereafter? That is a good question. I think that um, having the design standard take off is definitely one of my dreams. And um, take off in a way that like lead the lead standards are to environmental sustainability. Um, my dream is that the design standards would become standard practice that um, and then everyone uses before they launch into a housing development. So my lofty goal is really just having the design standards kind of accepted as the new normal in terms of inclusive housing. I so love I, that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then on a larger note, just with the Kelsey, my lofty goal there is just to see this kind of inclusive development um, sprout all over the U.S. and eventually the world. So, like I said, with the dual mission, so we do um, policy and system change work, but we also build communities. So um, I would love to see the kind of communities that we have in San Jose and San Francisco sprout up um all over the u.s i i definitely agree like i would love to see kelsey standards become like the standard standards you know like it's just like yeah. common practice to your point and uh, what excites me and what I, what I feel hopeful about also, you know, lead became lead, but also it became a marketing thing. And so people wanted to like go for the marketing or it's almost like a branding, a building in a way. Um, but, you know, we recently had a panel discussion uh, on what's wrong with architecture. And one thing that came up was also like form follows finance really in architecture. And um, so the conversation around ESGs and, in, investors really also starting to look out for environmental, social, and governance practices in in um, a company uh, structure is exciting for me because I'm hoping that also eventually like reflects into the built environment where if a bank is financing a project, if the government is financing a project, if a developer is looking for funding. Um, this becomes part of their standards too, right? Investors want to invest in projects where they see authentic inclusion. And um, I feel like Kelsey creates the foundation for that to be able to happen with the standards it created. And I really, like my dream also to build on Kelsey is this to like see this becoming like an investment standard, right? So if really um, the built environment is dependent on finance world, the finance world demanding this from um, 
projects that are being delivered in the built environment. I would love to see that um, for Kelsey too, and just for like all of us. <laughs> I'm glad that you brought up the financial piece because that's one that I skipped. But um, and I'm sure that you've seen this. Um, accessibility often becomes the scapegoat for accessibility. People think that making something accessible is going to cost all this extra money. And so we're in an age now where architects and developers just want to do the bare minimum so they don't get into any legal trouble. And so some of the is just shifting attitudes like, we aim to design for everyone, um, not disabled people included. And one of our catchphrases, so to speak, is just that um, making things accessible and inclusive ends up benefiting everyone. Um, and so I... I'm not sure if this is just an American thing, but we call it the um, curb cut effect. So when curb cuts first became a thing, they were pretty much just for people in wheelchairs. Like, oh, that's an accessibility thing for people in wheelchairs. But now, like you were saying, pushing a stroller, being on crutches, being a traveler on your way to the airport, curb cuts end up being helpful and beneficial to a number of different people, not just people with disabilities. So the curb cut effect, and then I did want to say just financial, I totally um, agree with you that um there is a financial and a monetary piece to accessibility and inclusion. And I really hope that the design standards are a way that we can show people that um, accessibility doesn't have to suffer because of price. Um, really, there are a lot of things that are of no extra cost or, or not monetarily burdensome in any way, but they just make for um, better design, which is our end goal. I totally agree. I feel like um, that becomes the excuse a little yes. bit. And yes. of course, in any project, like there would be like an ideal scenario and there could be a cost engineer scenario. And I get that. But I think just starting out a project with like creating a, your own glass ceiling thing, like we're going to do the bare minimum. You're already like by the time you're done with the building, uh, it's outdated. Right. So like forget the conversation around like sustainability. And I want to remind this is a reminder for all of us that we're all aging. So right, like with aging can come various needs, um, access needs, and just like to your point, like convenience and just being yeah. helpful. Um so one in that thing, sense, I think one thing that it. I'll throw in there is I always say even able bodied people are one accident away from being disabled. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Or even like temporary life stages, right? Like a pregnancy, um, and you know, pushing a stroller, like all the things that we're talking about, or temporary injuries, like all of that. I think we just need to um, really acknowledge that inclusive design is just better design. We see that in products. Like nobody is going to argue. Like I think the best case example is an iPhone, right? Like the touch screen was an accessibility need that turned out that was favored by everybody on the planet. So I think we can just like, um, there are great examples in like other industries where we see how uh, bringing access actually broadens use. Um, so we kind of need to adapt that faster. And real estate always lags a little bit in all conversations, but we do hope, you know, we're start picking up on it more. And thankfully like organizations like Kelsey, um, we can expedite that change. 
Um, I do want to be mindful of our time. So I do want to skip to the last part where I ask about okay. for those who want to push boundaries, um, make some positive change in any field that they're in, what would be your advice to them? Um, that is a good question. What would it be? Um, just don't take no for an answer. Um, keep knocking on that door until it opens. Um, because if Michaela, who is um, the Kelsey CEO, if she had stopped with the first person that was like, oh, that will never work. Like, people with disabilities is not, um, combining it with housing just isn't smart. If she had listened to the first no that she heard, the Kelsey wouldn't be where it is now. So um, don't take no for an answer. I um I love that. And I think, you know, there's no day that we don't want to hear that. You know, that's always a good, good reminder for ourselves that we need to push for what we believe in. And yeah. if we don't believe in ourselves, nobody's going to believe us in any way. So in that sense, um, thanks for reminding uh, us uh, that. Well, Fatma, this was a pleasure. Thank you so much for making the time. And oh, thanks course. for all the work you do at Kelsey. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I, I'll, wake, I'll wake up in the middle of the morning anytime for you. <laughs> uh, well, we won't make you do that. Hopefully <laughs> next time we meet in person at a sane hour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But thank you so much. This was a treat. And that is this week's episode of What's Wrong With The Podcast. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other podcasting platform. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Links can be found in the episode description, and you can also find them on our website. If you found value in the show, we would appreciate if you could rate us and leave a review, or you can simply tell your friends about us. For more details on our guests, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Don't forget to join us next week. Thank you for listening.